Epic Measures is the true story of the largest study of human health ever undertaken. It starts more than 40 years ago with a Land Rover crossing the Sahara Desert and encompasses wars and famines, presidents and activists, billionaires and billions of people worldwide living in poverty. While this is one of the largest scientific projects ever attempted, as breathtaking as the first moon landing or the Human Genome Project, the questions it answers are meaningful for every one of us. What are the world's health problems? Who do they hurt? How much? Where? Why? Once we can accurately measure how people live and die, we can understand what makes us sick and begin to improve it. This work has already transformed health systems from Mexico to Australia, and it has also shown Bill Gates a way to invest his fortune for global good. Now it may help people everywhere, all 7 billion of us, live longer and better lives. Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. Aloha, ladies and gents. My name is Adam. We just uh, had the interview with Jeremy Smith about a pretty interesting book, Epic Measures. Yeah, Epic Measures by Jeremy N. Smith. Uh, One Doctor, Seven Billion Patients is the subtitle. And basically, it's this, this crazy dude, Chris Murray. His family went over to Africa when he was nine or ten years old. There was no hospital there, so they basically set up a, a couple of tents and the whole family just ran, made up a hospital where the dad was a doctor, the mum was a nurse, the older son was the ambulance driver, yeah. and Chris was the chemist. So, so yeah, crazy. he went on. He wasn't happy with how the world uh, documented the health problem. So as one man, he went on about it, took the goal on it himself, and he, he changed how the whole world looks at health with the global burden of disease study. Basically, no one knew what was killing people or why or how. It was just assumptions and everyone was in their own little silos. If if they studied malaria, then they thought malaria was killing everyone. Yep. And they found out, they asked a few different people, you know, how many people is this killing each year? And when they added up a few of them, they already doubled the number of deaths there actually were that year. So they were way off. And so they set out to do this data collection and work out, you know, what are the world's health problems? Who do they hurt? how much, where, and why. And they've made this amazing tool, didn't they? Yeah, that's right. So if you want to find out how you're most likely to die and what specific actions you can take to, to not die, then uh, this book is for you, or you can look further into the, to the study with the, the show notes. Yeah, you can, it drills right down to specific ages, specific areas, and exactly what your biggest risks are. All right, mate, let's get into the interview. Stuff. Yeah, hey, Jeremy. A, I was about to say good morning, but it's good afternoon for you. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, we got you perfectly. Ready to get into it? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, obviously, epic measures we've read and and uh, and reread now. Um, can you give us a quick uh, introduction to your yourself, though? First of all, sure. I am a journalist specializing in profiles, so I like to look at the stories of people and also of big ideas. Ideally, I like to have someone who whose personal story has something kind of at stake, and often something that's hard to understand at first, but once you get into it, you find there's a pretty deep story behind it. Uh, so if I can do that kind of explaining in an adventurous way, I'm excited. Yeah, that sounds um, exactly yeah. like Dr. Chris Murray. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you super interesting story, Chris Murray. Thanks for, for uh, profiling your story. Uh, could we just get into a bit about Chris and his, his upbringing? Because he's a pretty crazy guy who kind of changed how, how the whole world looks at health. Very impressive dude. Yeah, and a remarkable family, really. I mean, he's the youngest of four kids. And when he is, gosh, nine years old, the his father, who's a professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota in the United States, uh, has a sabbatical. And the family decides on their leave, rather than the father just doing academic research or taking time off, that they're going to sort of put him to work and the kids really goad him. Can you do something useful, not just study? <laughs> and that turns into quite an adventure. And uh, the mother, the father, the 17-year-old son, the 16-year-old son, and eventually the 10-year-old son, Chris, uh, 
end up buying a couple of Land Rovers, traveling for months through the Sahara Desert, and, and finally, you know, through drought, famine, disease, uh, and just sand, <laughs> to uh, this sort of small town in Niger, which is then and now one of the poorest countries in the world. They'd been signed up to volunteer at a local hospital there, and when they reached it, they found there was indeed a hospital there. <laughs> All, uh had no doctors, nurses, medicine, water, or power, but it had many patients or at least people in need waiting outside. And they had to decide then, are we going to try to make this work or are we going to go back two months the way we came? Yep. Mm -hmm. And what, so, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. What, what did they, so what did they do? They set up a tent basically, is that right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, dad becomes the chief and only surgeon, mom becomes the head of nursing, sister sweeps the wards, holds flashlights up so dad can see while he's operating on people. The older brother operates the Land Rovers as an ambulance and uses them to carry water. Mm. And 10 year old Chris becomes the pharmacist and sort of run <laughs> around. So, uh, and they keep, they basically get addicted to this kind of service. Yeah really love it. They learn from it. They start publishing scientific papers about uh, some of the things they see and find that are contrary to expected uh, conventional medical wisdom of the time. Yep. And so basically, you know, by the time Chris is 13, he's a co-author on a peer-reviewed publication in the British medical journal, The Lancet. By the time he's 18, he's got close to a dozen of these publications. He has almost a decade of medical experience, and he's a freshman at Harvard. Yeah. So pretty remarkable childhood. So it seems like at this point, uh, <laughs> it kind of planted a seed in, in Chris's mind about like what he he saw or how easily some of the, the things could have been overcome. And basically that no one knew or no one had documented how people are, are dying in, in the world, right? Yeah, I mean, what was so surprising to me when I started writing this story and then when I just got it verified over and over and over again, couldn't... I believe that no one had told it before was just that prior to the project that he would go on to found with uh, his Australian colleague, Alan Lopez, uh, prior to that project, people did not know what people were dying from around the world. They, they sort of had different groups in different places studying one particular people or one particular disease. And those, those guesses were, were just that, guesses. They mm. didn't add up to reliable numbers. And if you don't know what people are dying from, how on earth can you save lives? Yeah. So those get was it just anecdotes and, and assumptions, was it? They just they just assumed that these diseases are what's killing people? Or how did they come to those? Well, what you had is, first of all, it's a very hard problem to solve. Mm, absolutely. So you think about it a bit more. You know, even in countries like the United States or Australia where you have well-developed you know, death certificate systems, even there, death certificates are often inaccurate, you know, uh, as much as half of the time. Mm -hmm. They might have causes like heart failure, which sound convincing as a cause of death, but if you think about it, every single person who is dead has heart failure. So that's not <laughs> yeah. an ultimate cause of death. You have to know what caused the heart failure. And meanwhile, for most people around the world, in most places, there are not birth certificates, there are not death certificates, there are not doctors, there are not public health officials in large numbers. And so it's really hard to know who's out there and what they're suffering from. And so you have these scattered groups like UNICEF studying uh, diseases of children, you have cancer you know, groups, you have groups in the United States like Mothers Against Drunk Driving studying you know, car accidents caused by alcohol. Mm -hmm. But those groups were not using consistent methods. They weren't always using scientific methods. They always uh, had a dual role as both advocates for a cause and people trying to measure it. So they would tend to overestimate the people suffering from their particular cause. So uh -huh. for example, you know, Murray's colleague, Alan Lopez, was working at the World Health Organization in Geneva, and he went basically door to door to the different groups at the World Health Organization, the premier you know, authority on health and said, how many people are dying from the disease you're studying? How many people are dying from the disease you're studying? He went oh, yeah. to about five of these doors, he took the numbers, and it was a simple calculation. He added them up, and just from those first five doors alone, 
he got a number that was twice the total number of people who had died in the previous year. Oh, gosh. So <laughs> you had 15, you know, you had the leading authority on health inventing 15 million extra dead people pretty much by accident. And meanwhile, people die from many more than just five causes. So they had invented 15 million people, and they were probably mm. missing millions more. So that sort of showed the the need for a big picture view. Yep. Just shows the misallocation of the world's resources trying to solve potentially the wrong po- problem. So Chris, like, fo- Chris and Je- uh, Alan Lopez focusing on this could pen- potentially have saved millions of lives. It's- yeah, I mean... You, you, you see these very early findings, like from Lopez, that you have millions of people dying from tobacco, and they're not being studied because uh, they're not children, and the child survival had been the focus of world health efforts. And what happens is, if you get children to live past their fifth birthday, that's wonderful, but they don't magically turn into 85-year-old Norwegians, right? Mm-hmm. So. They can die of all sorts of other things they discovered, car accidents, violence, uh, mm-hmm. tuberculosis, smoking, cervical cancer. You know, there's all sorts of things that happen between your fifth birthday and old age. And they found that these were having a huge toll, but there was nobody studying them because there was this sort of information gap. It seems uh, so obvious in hindsight that this needed to be done but and almost unfathomable that it, it took so long. But... Um you also mentioned the, the word, you said suffering. So it wasn't just about people dying, was it? It was, it was also about things that uh, hurt people but didn't kill them. Yeah, Murray had this insight that, again, to me was almost obvious once I heard it but had never occurred to me before, and I like to think that I'm well-read and thoughtful. And basically his insight was good health is a lot more than just not being dead. Mm. <laughs> so you can not be dead and not be healthy. But yeah. if the only statistic you follow is who dies of what, then you're going to miss a lot of pain and suffering. And there's a bunch of conditions that not only kill people but cause grievous injury without killing them, like car mm. accidents. And then there's whole sorts of conditions that kill no one but cause a huge amount of pain and suffering, whether it's back pain, neck pain, arthritis, depression, anxiety. And as they studied these conditions, they realized that not just tens of millions of people, but billions of people, including people in the poorest countries in the world, were suffering from these conditions, and they were suffering them for decades. And so if you don't measure those, you're not going to have them on your map, and you're not going to be able to direct resources to them effectively. And of course, you know, I, for me, I just thought of this, and I thought, of course, this is where almost all of health spending goes in a wealthy country like the United States or Australia, right? I mean, every time you go to the doctor and don't die afterward, you're showing how important it is to measure these other things. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And so, 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 what did they do? What did Chris and, and Alan do, and how did they go about it? Yeah, so they founded this project that. Uh, you know, I sort of uh, would compare it to sort of Google Earth for health, where mm-hmm. you can sort of zoom out and see what's hurting people and what's making them sick and what's killing them in the whole world. Or you can zoom into a particular region or a particular country or a particular age group like men or women or children. And uh, what they called this project was the Global Burden of Disease Study. And they basically tried to measure three things. They tried to measure who dies of what. In other words, what are the leading causes of death in each country? And they basically said, when you add up who dies from each cause, it has to equal the total number of deaths. They sort of introduced (laughs) double. They sort of introduced sort of double entry bookkeeping to debt to you know. (laughs) And they also said. Let's go for these things that are harder to measure, but just as important. Mm -hmm. And one of those measures was called years of life lost. And that basically said, if you die at age 80 of a stroke, and you die at age 5 of meningitis, those are both deaths, one death, one death, but those are very different circumstances. And we probably want to direct more resources to preventing someone dying at a very early age from a preventable disease than the sort of inevitability of dying in old age. And so years of life law says, how long do people live in the longest living countries in the world? 
and then if you die short of that life expectancy, for each death, there's sort of you've lost that many potential years of life. Yeah. Finally, there's this measure: years live with disability, mm-hmm. and those are for all those diseases and injuries and illnesses that don't kill people but cause a huge amount of suffering. And again, it's a little tricky, but basically, it's how much does this hurt times how long do you suffer it, and that gives you a comparable measure to that years of life loss. So you can add those together, and you get kind of years of healthy life loss from a particular cause. Yep. So, uh, what what were the findings of the study? What ended up being uh, the greatest uh, burden of disease, so to speak? Yeah. Well, it's a really interesting mix. So what you have is these causes that we think of as the causes of global health, even today, like diarrheal diseases and pneumonia that are caused by infections and poor drinking water and lack of access to you know basic uh, vaccinations yep. and neonatal disorders, uh, you know things related to childbirth because of poor birthing conditions, and then infectious diseases like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis. But even greater than those, and again, even in poor countries, were cardiovascular diseases, cancers, chronic respiratory diseases, unintentional injuries, diabetes, transport injuries, mm-hmm. and you know things like suicide and neurological disorders. And again, this is worldwide dominated by poor countries. So even in the poorest countries in the world, part the same things that are killing people – in wealthy Western countries are the dominant causes of death mixed in with the traditional causes of championed by global health. Yep. So what was the result? So did uh, the World Health Organization or specific countries, did they uh, change where they channeled funding and their resources as a result of, of this study? Yeah, I mean, it's been an interesting you know, journey to see sort of the impact after the origins of the Global Burden of Disease Study. And as you know, it it draws in, you know, rival billionaires. Uh, it draws in, you know, sort of mm. politicians at the leading levels of both the World Health Organization and just the world period. But in short, we, we talked about Chris Murray and his adventures up to the age of 18. Well, he becomes a Rhodes Scholar. He gets a, you know, a PhD in economics from Oxford. He goes to Harvard Medical School He leads this initial version of the study with Alan Lopez, and by the time he is 35 years old, he is second in command at the World Health Organization, and he has this charge to lead this new information uh, to transform how they do things. Now, there's a big problem there. The World Health Organization is led by individual countries and individual charities, all of whose numbers he had roundly challenged. Mm -hmm. Trees. (laughs) Yeah. Countries and politicians might want their numbers to look worse so they can get more aid money. They might yeah. want them to look better so they can be reelected. Yeah. Mm. And, and they might just not know but still want to pretend that they have a reasonable you know, grasp on what's going on. Yeah. And by challenging all of those things in a very direct and in sometimes abrasive manner, uh, very hard charging, you know, Murray created – uh, essentially 300 enemies and that's being <laughs> the ministers of health uh, for each nation of the world who elect leadership of the WHO yeah. and you know whenever you have a ranking of 300 countries in terms of how well they're doing one country is going to be first and every other country isn't and in fact you know, <laughs> 200, <Yeah. laughs> uh, you know 290 are going to be out of the top 10 yeah. so uh in short order, you know, I said he was second in command by the time he was 35, and he was fired by the time he was 40. There's mm-hmm. a sort of period in the wilderness, uh, if you call going back to Harvard and leading a giant institute wilderness, uh, and then <laughs> uh, he gets the attention of, you know, the richest person in the world, you know, Microsoft co-founder mm. Bill Gates. Yeah. yeah incredible. That's a- yeah, amazing. So, I like that those warring billionaires uh, you mentioned. There was a, a few funny stories there. Um, oh, we really like the the the, the afterword, the bit at the end, titled uh, "How to Live Longer and Healthier." How to live a, a longer and healthier life. Yeah. yeah, what I love about this information is a country can use it to set policy. 
uh, a global donor like the Gates Foundation can use it to direct funds worldwide and track how things are doing. But you can zoom all the way in uh, to sort of see how you're doing, how your county's doing, how your country's doing. So, you know, for me, uh, you know, I am a male in the state of Montana, in the county of Missoula, in the United States. I have, you know, between the age of 35 and 40, I have a six-year-old daughter. I have a wife about my age. I have a niece in her early 20s who lives with us. And all four of us face really different health conditions as a group. And so, you know, I can look and say, okay, what's most dangerous for my niece in her early 20s? Gosh, it looks like it's a college town. It looks like alcohol consumption is, you know, a leading cause of illness and injury and death. I can look for myself. I'm a little older, maybe a little more sedate. Uh, my group, my gender, my age, it's processed lunch meat. So mm, yeah. <laughs> you kind of get a sense of, uh, you know, for my daughter, it's it's crossing the street. You know, it's transport. It's, mm. it's unintentional injuries from car accidents. So you can kind of look and see not just how you're doing and what you should be worried about, but you can also look next to you and you can look and see, What's a place that has a similar income level to me, for example? Yeah. And do they have the same causes? Because what you find when you look at this information is that places that do have really similar economic levels may have really different health outcomes and really different health progress. Mm -hmm. And Australia is a, you know, an example I use a lot in the book, uh, as you guys know, mm. uh, because it was one of the earliest and most rapid uh, adopters of using this information to direct policy. And partly as a consequence, the health gains in Australia have been uh, extraordinary. You see, you know, a generation or two ago, uh, the United States and Australia, both about the middle of the pack in terms of life expectancy, for example, uh, among the sort of 40 wealthy countries of the world, they're both about in their twenty in the sort of mid 20s. Today, Australia's you know, top five, United States is dead last. And so oh. the gap between sort of life expectancy in our countries, and, you know, to me that matters. That means how long I'm going to live. <laughs> have, you know, if I have my daughter in Australia, as opposed to, you know, here uh, at a national level, you know, she's expected to live five years longer. Wow. Yeah. You know, that that's that's tangible. Mm, and definitely. meanwhile, there are parts of the United States where people live longer than Australia. There are people, parts of the United States where people live shorter than Syria. So you kind of have this map and you can see what's going on and then start to see why. Yep. Amazing. So it's obviously different for each country, but as a result of the, the study, what is the one action that we can do, say, if you lived in USA and, and you, the middle of your life, say your mid-20s or 30s, what is the one action you can take if you wanted to to live longer yeah or so many yeah so you you tell me you want me to look globally you want me to look at an age group <laughs> you know you want me to look at australia you want me to look at the united states you I'll tell be, me I'll be, yeah. I'll be selfish and i'll say look at australia <laughs> mid 20s mid 20s <laughs> so australia i'm going to look at uh i'll be a little broader i'll look at between the ages of 15 and 49 yep lovely i'll look uh i'll look for men and I'll start zooming in here. Yeah. No, she's so uh, alcohol use is your biggest risk. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Okay. Followed, yep. by, followed by drug use, yep. followed by smoking, followed by, you know, overweight, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Wow. And then rounding out the top 10, you got not eating enough fruit, not eating enough vegetables, mm. not having enough low grains. Wow. That's, uh, that's great because that, all of that seems very actionable. So if you do any of those, it's quite easy to, to change uh, a bit of your lifestyle to live a bit longer. Yeah, and if I just toggle that, for example, to females, same age group, yep. it does move around a bit. Number four is intimate partner violence. So oh, wow. uh, that's cool. so. In other words, in Australia, for women, in terms of death, risk of death between the ages of fifteen and forty-nine, uh, intimate partner violence is a bigger risk than, for example, being overweight. That is wow. number five. And occupational, occupational injuries are basically tied with high cholesterol. Yeah. So there are these things that you're going to see on the you know, wow. glossy magazines. You're going to see on the glossy magazines, and then there's going to be the things that aren't. Yeah. 
Mm. You know, what's going on in the workplace for women in Australia that is, you know, uh, go, you know, that is a risk and what's going on obviously domestically in the home. Yeah. So, you know, you look at the big picture for the whole country, uh, all age groups, uh, both sexes, and some of these things like alcohol use drop way, way down because we're not just talking about guys in their 20s anymore. Uh-huh. And we're back to high blood pressure, then smoking, then high cholesterol. Yep. And, uh, you know, again, I mean, it's amazing. Australia's made one of the, you know, it's one of the most progressive countries in terms of fighting smoking from a public health perspective in the government. And, uh, or at least has been, you know, in my reporting. And nonetheless, it's still a huge toll. The United States, we've made less progress, and it's it's, but big progress, but even less progress, and it's it's even bigger. So uh, there's still some of the old demons, and then there's then there's new ones that we might not have thought about before, whether they're domestic partner, you know, intimate partner violence, or whether they're occupational injury, or you know, I remember looking uh, in the United States as a whole. I feel like it was you know for a while it was diet low in fruits for most people. So the <laughs> The proverbial, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, that one might be worth repeating. That's yeah, amazing. wow. It's a seriously amazing tool, isn't it? It's yeah, incredible. Yeah, you can, can look and see. I mean, they'll give you an estimate of, you know, literally what's the qual- what's the sort of quality of life it's taking, what's the number of years it's taking at a population level. Amazing. We might just uh, shift gears a little bit. You said you you consider yourself pretty uh, well-read and well-informed. What are, what are some of your favorite books? Well... I, you know, I've been sort of hopping back and forth since I started writing nonfiction books. I've been reading more nonfiction. Before that, you know, I was, I was a big novel reader, and I like to sort of bring that sense of story and character and plot mm. to to true stories to this nonfiction stuff. So, you know, to me, one of my you know nonfiction you know kind of guide guides as a storyteller is is the writer Michael Lewis who mm. wrote uh, Moneyball and Big uh, Short. Big Short, a number of other books like that. Lately, I've been uh, uh, studying hackers for a new project, so I've been sort of reading a lot of thrillers, mysteries, adventures, just to kind of figure out how do you pace things that involve, you know, typing on a keyboard. How do you make that exciting? So, yeah, you know, trying to figure that out. Nice. <clears throat> so, uh, what? Throughout all your the books you've written and the books you've read and and throughout everything you've done, what is the most valuable thing you've learned? And you can interpret that in any way you like. Yeah, I mean, to me, I just try to. I feel very lucky as a profession yeah. because my job is to be curious, and so I, I guess we share that. And you could say uh, through your podcast. So my job is just sort of just to be interested in people. So I love, you know, to me there's never sort of small talk because if I'm talking to people, I'm always sort of probing for that story. Maybe it's bad because I'm never off work, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm surprised over and over that people, because of how often and just sort of the routine of their job, they've become, they see it as normal, whatever it is. Yeah. And so... Uh, to me, it's often new, and everyone in every profession has this sort of inside information, if you will. And I love sort of learning and getting that inside information and just trying to see the world through their eyes. Because when you do that, you realize people really see things differently. And the story of Epic Measures is so much of how do we get a common big picture so we don't let our biases blind us. Love it. Amazing. Uh, I've got another another question in regards to... You said that you're... You're not a doctor by any means. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's a a two part question. How did you how did you get yourself involved in in this story and this book? Uh, and and secondly, I guess what was your your process? It would have, you're so knowledgeable about this area. You must have become obsessed with it for for a period of time. Yeah, absolutely. It's a funny story how I got into the book. Um, a friend of mine from high school uh, went to MIT, you know, famous, you know, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and majored in math. He then went to Carnegie Mellon University and got a PhD in math. He then went to Microsoft Research and he was doing more math. 
I looked him up on book tour uh, for my first book. I was going through Seattle, and I remembered Microsoft is in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And when I looked him up, I saw that he was now a professor of global health at the University of Washington. Now, this was a guy I'd known since we were both about 10 years old. And I knew that he had taken maybe one biology class in his life. He was not a viable applicant for med school. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow he was a professor of global health. So mm -hmm. something in health had changed if they were, all of a sudden they were hiring mathematicians. And I called him and said, what's going on? And he turned out he was you know, one of these hired hands uh, brought on by Chris Murray and Alan Lopez to deliver some of the brain power necessary to do the – amazingly complex calculations necessary cool. for the development of disease study. Uh, that led me to the study. I learned Chris's childhood story, and I started realizing that could be a chapter. I learned about the rival billionaires. I thought that could be a chapter. Yeah. I learned about the rise and fall of the World Health Organization. I thought that could be a chapter. And then meanwhile, you have these results where you could write a whole book just about you know women of a certain age in France mm. and – you could, you could dive into the data there. So I had to sort of find a way, how can I tell some of the most interesting stories about the data without it just sort of being a big list? And to me, the way to do that was to tell it kind of chronologically and see people who'd grasped how useful this way of looking at the world could be. And, you know, whether it was in Mexico or Rwanda or Australia or anywhere else, and what they had done trying to use this information and the results they'd found. Love it. Yeah. Awesome. It's an awesome story. And uh, even uh, AJ Jacobs, I saw on the back here, gave you a little blurb and he said it's a, a made for Hollywood character. Definitely. Uh, I could see this as a movie, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Hope, uh, yeah. Just, you know, send an extra fast uh, podcast download to anyone subscribing yeah. from the Hollywood area. Yeah. Spot on. That's it. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for your time, Jeremy. That was. Uh, definitely a great book we learn a lot from it and got a few actionable things we can take away uh how else can people find the study or we're going to have a link to the to the book for people to, to to buy but how can they find more information on the study if they like yeah absolutely you know the afterword of the book sort of tells you as you said sort of how to use the information how to find more but you know my website's got lots of links jeremynsmith.com and the website for the study itself and the larger institute that Chris Murray leads is called healthdata.org. And you can click to the uh, visualization tools and start exploring. Yeah, amazing. amazing. Love it, mate. All right, thanks for your time and uh, in, enjoy the rest of the, the day. You too. Be well. Thanks for your call. Cheers, I appreciate mate. it. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys, for listening. We hope you enjoyed that interview. We got a lot out of it, and I'm sure you did too. Guys, if there's one thing you can do for us, it would be hit subscribe or write a review. It means a lot. Give us good uh, good ratings on iTunes and more people are listening out here. Yep. Even mention it to one friend and say, no, there's two blogs there, right? And yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Sure, it is.